Okay. Amazing. The reason I did that is because there's an element of consciousness. You've got the visual part, you've got the emotional part, you've got all these parts of any given part is missing. It alters your consciousness. And we normally think of the old Aristotelian dichotomy that rationalism is here and emotionalism is here. Well, the new idea in psychology right now is embodied cognition and that emotion has everything to do with rationality. You can't separate the two. That's a great example. That if he doesn't have the emotional feeling, response to something he should respond emotionally to, that's an imposter, okay? So that's an element of your consciousness and that didn't evolve all as a piece, okay? And so, just another example of how we can tweeze it apart. So here's jo uh, Michael Gonzanica, I couldn't do any of his stuff, one of my favorite authors, and Joseph Ledoux, who actually got me started on this whole path by reading a paper of his from 84. And they say, the view of neuroscience today is that consciousness does not constitute a single generalized process. It is becoming increasingly clear that consciousness involves a multitude of widely distributed specialized systems and disunited processes, and therefore the integrated mind completely contrary to what Harris is trying to drive at, that it's a single piece. Okay. How did we get there? I'm going to do this real short because this would be a whole other lecture. This is where I'm going with my research. Here's a picture of an australopithecine hand in a human hand where they're only about three feet tall. But the important thing is they've got a huge thumb just like ours. If this was a chimp hand, the thumb would stop about down there. By three million years ago, we had almost fully hominid hands. We were doing things, manipulating the environment with that hand, unlike any other animal, anywhere, anytime. By 2.6 million years ago, we were making stone tools, very simple tools, and we were defleshing animals with them. Through that, I think we developed what I call 2-HCMFG, which is two-handed competence manufacture. 90% of us are right-handers, okay? And we hold the object we're going to work on in our left hand, orient it in space, and we hit it with our right hand, okay? And the right-handed 90% population bias, okay, developed the cerebral asymmetry in our brains. Most of our spatial stuff is in the right side that runs the left hand. Most of our analytic and sequential skills are in the left side that run this hand and, not surprisingly, language. Got <coughs> on top of those prior spatial and sequential skills. Can't go through it all, take us hours. By about a half a million years ago, we were making what's called later Australian hand axes, which is like one of these things. And there's a million important things about this. I'll give you the short version. You can't just sit down for a couple minutes and knock off a couple of sharp edges and do what you did two and a half million years ago. By half a million years ago, we had to have really long, sustained attention to build this thing. And we had to do deliberate practice. It may take an experienced splint napper, a guy that makes stone tools like this, it may take you a year to teach yourself how to nap stone this well. Okay? And this Matt Rosano wrote an excellent paper in 2003 saying that deliberate practice, in order for you, even if you're just practicing your tennis swing over and over again, right? It makes you think of a goal that you want to get to, you practice toward a sub-goal, you get a little better, right? And then like another month later you do it, you may do this for 10, 15 years, okay? Or you do this for a year just to get to this point. Take sustained attention, deliberate practice requires consciousness, okay? So we may have an inkling that the beginnings of human consciousness might have showed up at least about a half a million years ago. I'm not gonna go any further than that right now because I could spend hours on it and that's a whole nother lecture. So here's some actual pictures of tools. This is a remade one. These are ones I took pictures of at the Field Museum. In order to make those tools, you need to be conscious. You need to be able to practice. No other animal practices, okay? No other animal sits there for hours and hours and hours practicing their golf or their baseball or their, or their dart throw or whatever, okay? We practice and we teach. The animals don't. Embodied cognition, like I said, is the idea that our brains are situated inside our head and our thinking is situated inside this body, that you cannot divorce cognition from the fact that it's inside the body. So could we make a machine that's conscious someday? Maybe in principle we could, but it's going to need a lot of the attributes that we have, I think, because that's how we got something. And I'll get into that. 
one of the issues is how do we get the grounding problem? How do we get from, how do we get things to ever mean anything? And I think we first developed meaning in flaking those stone tools you just looked at. When you flake those tools, you can't just hit it haphazardly. You've got to hit it a very specific way. And hitting it this way means one kind of flake. Hitting it this way means a different kind of flake. Hitting it on edge means something different. And you do that for about a million years, Maybe a new set of neurons grow, another neuron column, or this starts to mean something to you. I think our first meaningful uh, actions were making these different stone tools. You didn't need it for the old ones of two and a half million years ago, and that's where my research is going this spring. Um, I think we also came up with agency and gesture, because you start going, if you, if you, if you were doing this, and you made this gesture to somebody else that also makes stone tools, they look at you and they go, they know what you mean. They know what you're doing, okay? Language may have evolved from gesture. That's another whole story. Plus, you also understand you're an agent. I did this to this. Yeah, that gesture came right after that. So, I think our concepts came out of this. I think animals have perceptual categories, okay? A dog can recognize different dogs. Some really good border collies can learn like four or five hundred different objects and you show them a picture of the object, it will run in the other room and find that very different object. But they do it on perceptual similarity, on shape, color, etc. And we group things on conceptual similarities, abstractions and stuff, and a long story. But I think this might have been the first object concept is that tool we made because if you look at the older tools, and I, damn it, I didn't bring a picture one, the older tools just you knock a few pieces off it, and it still just looks like a chipped rock, okay? It doesn't look like something different. But when you get done with the long process of, God, 75, 80 different procedures to get down to this, when you're all done, this doesn't look like anything in nature for the first time. This might be the first artifact that looks like something different, and you know you made it, okay? This might be our first object concept, and maybe we represented it by going like this. I don't know. Long story on all that. I study symmetry and some other concepts like that based on some tools. I won't go any further. It takes too long. I'm just finishing. It's 8.30, and I promised I'd be done in an hour and a half. I think when the brain gets sufficiently complex to evolve conceptual content, including our ideas of agency, self, time, etc., that that's what mediates our uniquely human conscious experience that's well beyond the mere sentience of all other animals. And the other thing is the human brain and its conceptual evolution may well be a one-off. It's not to say I don't think intelligence couldn't evolve someplace else. I'm sure life is going to be found someplace else. We're finding so many planets, so many things. We may even find microbes not under the ice on Mars. Life is not going to be a rare phenomenon. It's going to happen. But uh, self-conceiving life, conceptual life, I don't know. It's a one-off on Earth, okay? How many billions of species have ever lived and didn't evolve to self-reflexive consciousness? It doesn't happen all the time. And I don't think it's floating out there in the universe with Sam Harrison somehow absorbed into us. I don't buy all the crap. The elephant's trunk is a one-off. There's nothing else like it, okay? Um, the cetaceans, the dolphins, uh, porpoises, and whales, out of all the millions of mammal species that have ever lived, only one of them crawled back into the water and lost all its fur and became completely aquatic. There's plenty of aquatic mammals that live in the water for some time or hunt in the water, but then they live on land and have their babies on land and they still have fur and stuff. This only happened once. I have a feeling this only happened once because you had a bipedal primate, you needed binocular vision, and primate hands are close but then we evolved that Lucy's hand that was probably doing digging sticks and stuff. Then we started to manufacture stone tools, and that took another million years. Then we manufactured pretty boring stone tools for almost two million years, and nothing changed. So it's not inevitable. Then we started making things like this, and I think that's where the conceptual evolution and consciousness really started, because you need deliberate practice and consciousness, I think, to make these. I think we're almost on the right track. So it may well be a one-off. And I think there's a long, detailed story that I hope to be involved in telling over the next 10, 20 years before I croak um, about how it actually evolved. And when we get all those details, this won't be such a freaking mystery. So 
I won't let myself have the last word here. Conclusions. Colin McGuinn, New Mysterium, says the brain is only tangentially relevant to consciousness. How do you make an asshole statement like that? <laughs> <laughs> Harris, whatever insights are, arise from correlating metaphysical events, it seems unlikely one will be reduced to the other for the last time. Cue Descartes, I think not. <laughs> and I'm going to give Ramachandran, he deserves the last word. I'm not a researcher yet. The problem of self, far from being a metaphysical riddle, is now ripe for scientific inquiry. And that's it. And we're done.